going to review current pap smear and screening, screening and management guidelines. Uh, and these uh, slides were uh, already reviewed yesterday, um, but just a quick reminder for people who uh, are not sure where the eastern shore of Virginia is, which is where I practice. Uh, the eastern shore is actually a peninsula um, off of uh, the coast, the east coast of Maryland and Virginia, the lower um, part of which is Virginia. We're going to skip through these. Um, for, the, for those who uh, weren't here yesterday, um, you may recognize the uh, one of the barrier islands off the northern part of the eastern shore is Chincoteague, um, famous for uh, Chincoteague ponies, um, made famous by Marguerite Henry Cook, Misty of Chincoteague. Um, but more recently, people are familiar with the Wallops Island NASA facility, um, its rocket program. Um, next uh, is my disclaimer. Um, this, this talk actually developed um, from the fact that uh, I'm the only gynecologist in a uh, system of community health centers, uh, five different centers, um, and as I've tried to help my uh, primary care colleagues navigate through some of these changes, um, we tried to come up with uh, some talks to kind of explain things. So I will be the first to admit that these guidelines are complex and cumbersome. Um, I was not personally involved in the development of them. Um, and my goal is to try and highlight some of the common management issues that have come up and to review the current guidelines. Um, the references are ACOG practice bulletins and committee opinions, as well as the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology Consensus Guidelines. So um, some background on HPV. HPV is actually extremely easily transmitted during intercourse, but fortunately, most HPV-infected women do not develop significant cervical abnormalities. Um, HPV infection can actually be transient or persistent. I think that that may be a newer idea from what some of us were originally trained. Um, unfortunately, transient infections are the most common. Um, immune compromise increases the risk of a persistent HPV infection, and of those, smoking is by far the most important. So HPV, there are um, classes that are either oncogenic, high risk, or non-oncogenic, or as um, I sometimes refer to it, bad and less bad, because there's no such thing as good HPV. Um, type 16 and 18 are the carcinogenic, most carcinogenic, and responsible for the majority of cervical cancers. Um, there are 10 other high risk types as well that are responsible for the rest. Um, 6 and 11 are the most common of the non-oncogenic and responsible for most genital warts. Um, some interesting information from the CDC, there are actually 79 million Americans infected with HPV um, and roughly 14 million new cases a year, um, mostly among young teens and, teens and young adults who fortunately have the immune systems to handle that. Um, and this last one that I thought was really interesting, according to the CDC, almost every person who is sexually active will acquire HPV at some time in their life. Um, fortunately, we do have some vaccines. Um, currently, there are three licensed um, by the FDA. Um, the current recommendation is the vaccine for both males and females, ages 9 to 26, with a target age of 11 to 12. Um, the first is the bivalent or cervix, which is, um, covers type 16 and 18, the oncogenics, uh, the highly oncogenics. Um, the quadrivalent um, covers those as well as 6 and 11, um, those responsible for most genital warts. And then the newest would be the guard cell 9, um, which covers 9 types. Um, the dosing schedule, um, if the first dose is given before age 15, then only two doses are required. Obviously, that's ideal, um, with the second one being given 6 to 12 months later. If the series is started after age 15, it is a three-dose series, um, so a baseline, then one to two months later, and then the third one, six months after the first. HPV testing is not required either before or after vaccination. Um, we don't test new titers with the HPV. Um, HPV vaccination is still recommended even if there is a history of abnormal packs or genital warts um, because it's still possible for um, future exposure to additional types. 
Um, it is not recommended during pregnancy, but is recommended during breastfeeding if the patient is 26 years old or younger and had not been previously vaccinated. Um, in terms of infections, most women, especially younger women, have an effective immune response that will clear um, infections or reduce the viral load to undetectable levels within 8 to 24 months. Um, but in older women, um, these are more likely to reflect persistent infections that are acquired in the past and correlate well with the increasing rates of dysplasia with age. This slide is really the summary of um, the, the, why the changes in screening and management were made. So this is kind of a money slide in terms of understanding why changes were made. So uh, looking at abnormal PACs, low-grade dysplasia, CIM1, this is really now considered an acute infection um, with a high, a high rate of regression um, and expected management is considered prudent. On the other extreme, high-grade changes, CIM3, slow progression, three to seven years for severe dysplasia to progress to invasive cancers, and the indolent disease course is the justification for less frequent but more focused testing. Um, so the current guidelines in terms of um, pap screening, routine pap screening, is to begin at age 21, regardless of sexual history. For many of us, that's a change from what we were originally trained. Um, screening prior to age 21 should be avoided um, because teenagers have very low risks of cancer, and ultimately, screening may just lead to unnecessary and harmful evaluation and treatment. So routine screening uh, methods for ages 20 to 21, the recommendation is cytology alone. Uh, for those 30 to 65, the recommendation is cytology plus HPV testing every five years is the preferred method, um, although cytology alone every three years is acceptable. Um, what we've actually done in my organization, um, our electronic medical record is set up so that there are actually two choices. Um, so providers choose the one that is for ages 21 to 29, which is just cytology alone, or the one that is set up to be cytology plus HPV testing, therefore kind of making that decision making a little bit easier. For those over age 65 or who have had hysterectomy for benign indications, there is no recommendation to continue screenings unless they have had CIN3 or cancer, um, and then you continue for 20 years. So for example, um, if that diagnosis happened at age 50, screening would continue to age 70. Um, this is a subject that uh, sometimes needs some um, clarification. Um, this is something that has been particularly coming up in my organization. Um, just a reminder that hysterectomy refers to removal of the uterus. It doesn't tell you anything about the ovaries. The, the term partial hysterectomy is a lay term, it's not a medical term, and it's actually inaccurate. Um, there is such a thing as a supracervical or subtotal hysterectomy. That refers to removing the body of the uterus and leaving the cervix behind. That's important because that cervix then would require continued PAPs. Um, it can only be done abdominally. So someone who comes in and tells you they've had a vaginal partial hysterectomy has had a total vaginal hysterectomy. Um, and the indication for a subtotal or supracervical hysterectomy is usually either excessive scarring from previous surgeries and, or previous infection or an acute hemorrhage such as an obstetric emergency. Um, so visuals here. Um, just a reminder that skin incision tells you absolutely nothing um, about what kind of hysterectomy was done. So you can have um, a, a, a transverse incision or a vertical incision. Um, vertical incisions are, would be more commonly done with large um, fibroid uteruses um, or in cases where um, visualization is, want, is needed or sometimes again in obstetric emergencies. Um, again, Hysterectomy refers to removing the entire uterus. Supracervical or subtotal hysterectomy refers to removing the body but leaving that cervix, which still leaves the possibility of um, cervical dysplasia. Removing the uterus with the tubes and ovaries is referred to as a total hysterectomy with salpingo um, and, and that is different than um, just a total hysterectomy. 
So how should you document ovarian status? Again, if the ovaries remain ovarian conservation, not partial hysterectomy. If the ovaries were removed and the tubes are usually taken with them, um, and if it's both bilateral salpingoophorectomy, um, it could be, it's possible one could be removed, in which case it would be a unilateral. So back to PAPS, um, so common benign um, reports that you get on a PAPS report, you can get a, a report back that says the PAPS is unsatisfactory. Um, in that case, um, the recommendation is to repeat in two to four months to allow time for, sur for cell regeneration. You could get back a report that said that you had negative cytology but lacked an endocervical component. Um, this happens on occasion, and this is actually a frequent reason that I get a call from a colleague asking what to do. Um, basically, for those that are ages 21 to 23, you repeat it in three years. Um, and then for um, ages 30 to 65, the decision is basically based on the HPV status. Um, if it's negative, you repeat in five years. If it's positive, you repeat in one year. Essentially, no difference from whether there was or wasn't an endocervical component. There is no longer any recommendation to dilate cervixes to obtain endocervical cells. Uh, management of abnormal PAPs basically is now based on um, age, um, and those ages are broken into three groups, 21 to 24, 25 to 29, and 30 to 65. Um, for either um, ASCUS, atypical, or low-grade changes in that youngest group, 21 to 24. Cytology alone at 12 months is preferred. Um, if the 12 month repeat is negative or atypical or low-grade, you repeat again in 12 months. Again, we're trying to allow these younger patients' immune systems to, to do their job. Um, but if at 24 months, that's there is still any abnormality at that point, the patient is referred for colposcopy. On the other hand, if there are, um, if it's atypical favoring high, um, high grade changes, um, atypical glandular cell or high grade, then you go to colposcopy without repeating the path. If um, you have two consecutive negative results, uh, two years in a row, then you return to testing every three years until age 30. Um, and then co-testing after that, um, after age 30 or five years. For the um, slightly older group, the 25 to 29 year olds, there's a slight difference regarding the addition of HPV testing, which is actually preferred for this age group. That can be done as an add-on test or as a reflex. Again, my organization no longer orders reflex PAPs. Um, the other option um, is actually to just repeat the PAP in 12 months, which is what we do. Um, but if you do do the HPV and it's negative, you repeat a co-tested PAP in three years. If it's positive, you go to colposcopy. If you stick with the just repeating the PAP in 12 month option, um, if it's negative, you return to routine screening. If it's um, a repeat, a typical colposcopy. And then for the um, 30 to 65 year old group, again, the decision is based on the presence or absence of HPV. Um, if the HPV is negative, repeat um, co-testing um, in three years. If positive, go to colposcopy. In typical glandular cells, it's a totally different um, scenario. The, the question that needs to be answered is where did those glandular cells come from? Um, are they endocervical or are they endometrial? Um, so um, a colposcopy is done um, with endocervical curating to sample those as well as an endometrial biopsy. Um, if the endocervical um, curating is negative, the endometrial biopsy is negative, when the cervical biopsies are either CIN1 or less, the recommendation is to repeat co-testing in 12 months times two, and then space out to three years, and then after that um, to five. Low grade in um, older patients, ages 30 to 65, immediately go to colposcopy if they've got HPV or repeat testing in 12 months if the HPV is negative. Um, atypical squamous cells favoring high grade um, go to colposcopy regardless of HPV status. Um, there is an option for immediate leap for those over age 25 and that would be done really when you're concerned about being able to see the patient for follow-up fairly rarely. 
Um, for those for younger patients, if you've got a, re a report back like this and there's no visible lesion, the re current recommendation and the observation um, is cytology and colposcopy be every six months. And this is actually one of the rare um, situations where there's any recommendation for a six month repeat path anymore. If there's a visible, visible lesion, it needs to be biopsied. Um, and if, um, leave, if the uh, high grade persists for 24 months um, without identification of CIN 2 or 3, if the exam is inadequate, um, if there's uh, CIN uh, 2 or 3 out of the biopsy or the um, endocervical curing. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to do the audience participation. Um, but I, I actually am going to try and um, walk through the American Society of Colposcopy um, phone app, which is what most people use when trying to go through these. I originally was going to try and have us answer the questions without them, but as I, as I got to doing it, I realized that it, it really is just so much easier to do with the app. We're going to go through the app at length on Thursday with the other apps, but for now, um, we're going to go ahead and do that. So case number one um, is a 22-year-old G1P1 with an LSIL PAP, a baseline PAP was done 12 months ago and was asked this. And so the question is, do you A, um, schedule or refer her for colposcopy, B, repeat her cytology in six months, C, repeat cytology in 12 months, or D, order an HPV screen? So again, um, we're going to use the phone app to help us come up with the answer. So she is in the uh, 21 to 24 year old age group. We actually do not know her HPV status um, because she's not in a group that we would have checked it on. Um, and her initial cytology was atypical. Plug, yeah, plug in back in. Unplug it and replug it. <laughs> So um, I'm not sure how clear the algorithm is. Um, trying to figure. All right. So um, if we follow along the algorithm, we can see that the uh, answer is the pink box here, which says to repeat the cytology in 12 months, which would be C. So for the second case, we have that same 22-year-old. Um, the repeat PAP 12 months later also comes back to ask us. And so the question is, do we A, repeat cytology in three years since the trend is improvement, or PAP has, a, has improved from low grade back down to ask us. Do we order an HPV screen, or do we refer, um, schedule or refer her for colposcopy, or do we D, repeat her PAP in 12 months? Well, we've already repeated her PAP twice. And so at this point, the algorithm is going to show us that the next step is colposcopy. Okay, so for our next case, uh, we have a 64-year-old G3P3 with ASCA cytology, but no ECC uh, reported on her PAP report. She has a stenotic OS that was, that was noted when the PAP was done. Her HPV was not done due to low cellularity of the specimen, um, and, and that result does happen on occasion. Um, she has a history of one prior abnormal PAP at age 30, which was treated with cryotherapy, which probably explains the synodic OS. So the, uh, the question is, do we A, repeat her PAP in 12 months, B, um, repeat her PAP in three months, C, repeat her PAP in three months with cervical dilation to obtain cervical cells, or D, reassure her that because she hasn't had an abnormal PAP in 20 years, 
and screening can stop at 65, we shouldn't worry about it. So if we go back to our algorithm here, she is 64. We do not know her HPV status because they were not able to, to test. She's not pregnant. Um, she has ascus. Can you make that bigger? Okay, yeah. so at any rate, the answer um, in this case is that we're going to repeat her path in a year, 12 months. Did you rotate? Oh, that's better. Okay. Okay, so next case, we have a 25-year-old G0 with um, HSIL cytology. Um, and the questions are, do we A, order HPV screening, B, uh, order a PPAP in 12 months, C, schedule or refer her for cryotherapy, or D, schedule or refer for colposcopy or immediately? So, we've got a 25-year-old. Um, her HPV status is unknown. She has high-grade result. And either option is actually appropriate. Um, immediately or colposcopy. So answer D is correct. And next we have a 50 year old G2P2 with atypical glandular cells on her cytology. Her HPV is negative. So again, going to our app, she's 50. Um, her HPV is Negative, she's not pregnant, and her she's got atypical glandular cells. I'm sure not, still not sure how well this is showing up, but yeah, as we discussed cool. before, the answer is we need, since we need to figure out where those atypical glandular cells are coming from. She would have colposcopy with endocervical curating and endometrial biopsy. Okay, and last but not least, um, actually for this one you can go back to the regular slides. Um, and, and this one actually is, is, a, is a real case. Um, you have a 19-year-old G0 who presents with her mother who states that the patient needs a pap done because there's a strong family history of cervical cancer and that the patient has had three different sexual partners in the last six months. The patient denies any abnormal vaginal discharge or pain. Based on current guidelines, this patient should have A, a baseline pap done because she has risk factors for cervical cancer, B, a baseline pap with HPV screening due to her high risk of cervical dysplasia, C, a pelvic exam and swab for chlamydia and gonorrhea, or D, chlamydia and gonorrhea testing done either from a urine specimen or for a from a cervical specimen. And actually, everybody's got the correct answer, which is D. Um, she does not need a baseline pap. She certainly doesn't need HPV screening. Um, and at this point, um, with a completely asymptomatic patient, she actually doesn't even need a public exam. She needs STD screening. Um, so the, what we were looking at was a smartphone app from the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. Um, that is available for download from uh, for, for Apple and Android devices. Um, there is a um, ten dollar download fee. Um, it does help decision making, um, and this will be one of um, the many apps that we're going to review on Thursday when we do our app session. Uh, actually, as I'm talking to people, I'm hearing about new ones every day, so we may even add a few more new ones. No questions, no one. Okay. So we are um, getting questions from our web, webcast. Um, so pap smear guiding for, guide, the question is about pap smear guidelines for women over age 60. Um, and as we talked about, the current um, guidelines are for women age 30 to 65, um, cytology plus HPV co-testing every five years. 
Um, the second question is about women exposed to DES in utero guidelines for surveillance. Um, those are actually not covered by the current, uh, the current um, guidelines and actually fortunately becoming much less of an issue. Um, normal cytology but HPV positive in a patient ages 30 to 65. Um, it, again, the guidelines currently say to repeat that in a year. Um, and the question is um, whether cervical abnormalities are going to develop from what you're assuming is a persistent HPV um, infection in this patient. Um, and then the last question is for women over age 65 with new sexual partners, um, this has come up in my office as well, and currently that does not change the recommendations.